Hallelujah. Praise God. Is this the center? Usually? Let me make sure. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. It's good to be in the house once again. Hallelujah. Thank you for opening the door and inviting me and allowing me to be able to speak the word of God to you. But I have this one leading towards calling some people on this matter. How many of you men, you are here, you are married, but there is a challenge of becoming a father. Is there anybody in the house today and you are waiting on the Lord for a prayer, for a breakthrough? Is there anybody? If you are, then I'm just praying. I'm just praying that the Lord will cause his miraculous blessings to be upon you and your wife, and your wife, that in due time, that you will have the fruit of the womb, that you will be a father, and your wife will be a mother in the time to come. May God open that door, and I speak, and I declare that upon you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So, yes, my name is Francis Raj, born in Kuala Lumpur, left Malaysia 23 years ago to go to U.S. at the calling and the direction of God to go to the U.S. to study to become a mental health counselor, which is what I did. I went along with my wife and our two sons who were two, uh, three and five years of age. Today they are both married and, and wife is finishing up her Ph.D. in nursing and we went to a city called Lynchburg, Virginia. Anyone knows where Lynchburg, Virginia is? Okay, not a single hand. Understandable. Understandable. How many of you have seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? I see your hands. I see your hands. The hero in that movie is from my city. We have a highway expressway named after him, Desmond Doss. At the, almost the end of the movie where he meets his wife, you can see Lynchburg Hospital. So that's how you would connect Lynchburg, Virginia. So it's connected to that movie. That was in honor of Desmond Doss. So where I am coming from then is, is that when you saw Lynchburg Hospital, that was the first building, but now it has grown to be a huge hospital. And then they have an emergency room, which is possibly the third busiest in the state of Virginia. I was as a mental health professional at this hospital, and I am called to the emergency room whenever there are people who show up at the emergency room having failed suicide attempts. They experience such mental health devastation that they are on the process of terminating their lives. God had a calling upon my life to be able to present God and the Word in such a way. Even though I am a professional counselor, it is not necessarily I am a, I'm a Christian counselor, even though I am. But in the way that I'm presenting the gospel, in the way that I speak, God has allowed the door to be opened that I was able to minister to them. And many of them have said that they want to get back to church. Praise be unto God. And part of that experience was what led me to write this book. God anointed me to write this book because this is the experience of Job in the Bible of how he went through what he suffered. How can somebody like Job experience the losses of everything, take away all things where he experienced the death of his children and he experiences the loss of everything? Satan was doing all the damage to his life, 
but he didn't know, he didn't have a chance to know that the devil was behind it. And here he's frustrated, angry at his friends who were accusing him wrongly. And then he said, God, why are you silent? Why are you absent? I'm hoping to touch some of you here with the word of God that I want to present to you. But in context is Job was a man who lost everything. And then he went through a period of time, which I call in this book is your season of suffering. May your season of suffering be a season. It's not permanent. It is a season. But how do you survive and stay anchored in your season of suffering without losing hope and faith? How is it that Job can go to that place and say, though he slays me, yet I will trust him? How can a man, a Christian, say that? For he says in chapter 19, verse 25, he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, yet he's crying at the loss of everything. He's saying, For I know that my Redeemer lives. I don't know what struggles and challenges you are going through, and you may experience such things as Job is experiencing, that you find there is a time of silence that you are not hearing God's voice, and you feel like, God, where are you? Where are you? Are you not with me on this? How do we then get into an anchored place of knowing that you trust God? It may be cloudy and dark out there. You may not be able to see the sun. But as sure as you know that the sun will rise, you will know that God is there, even though you don't see him or you don't hear him. God is there for you. Today, I want to bring to you a message about Father's Day, but it's going to talk about God. As I remember, let me just make sure I say this. I brought limited number of books which I placed out there. It's about less than 90 books that I brought. If you order it on Amazon from Malaysia, it will be priced at 52 ringgit. Then you pay 21 ringgit uh, for shipping and handling. So that will be like 73 ringgit. Just to cover the cost of this book, I'm only selling it for 40 ringgit. And it's already signed. So grab your opportunity and get that autographed book on your way out. And you may not be going through your season of suffering, but please, if you know somebody who needs it, who needs it, somebody who's going through mental illness, who's suffering and struggling of knowing how to pass through their season of, of suffering, please take it, give it to them. Or Hold it in your hands when the, when the Lord leads you to such a person, you help them. Because the last part of the book, I teach about, about how to stay anchored, believe in a God who will never fail you. Who will never fail you. And a God who loves you unconditionally. A God who loves you in such a way that there is so much to know about this love of God. As a Christian, one of the fundamental cardinal principle in order for us to succeed as a Christian is to know without a shadow of doubt how much God loves you. This is so critical and I saw in the lives of many Christians that even as I saw them at the emergency room. Lynchburg, you, uh, Virginia is also the city that has Liberty University which has grown since I arrived since then by God's grace to become the largest Christian university in the world. So the city I'm from has the largest Christian university in the world and it's called Liberty University. But at the ER, I have seen pastors and Christian university students who have gone to the extent of wanting to hurt themselves. And sometimes along with substance abuse addiction, that also takes them to the point of being in danger of their lives and a danger to others. 
I have read some news that mental illness is on the rise even here. Even here, as it is rising. We must get onto the Word of God, stay anchored, learn the principles of how we can manage and handle our emotional intelligence that we can learn to grow as a Christian so that we can avoid those three main things which I call SAD, SAD, which is stress, anxiety, and depression. Sadness or stress, anxiety, and depression. So along with that today, I want to talk to you because it being Father's Day, I want to present to you about the Father's love. If you can know without a shadow of doubt the amount of love that the Father has for you, the amount of love that the Father has shown us through Christ Jesus, that will put us in a place of peace and safety and that place of security that we will know that we cannot fail. No matter what season we go through in our lives, we know we cannot fail because the love of God. I love many of the songs that we sang today about the Father's love. So to me, that's critical. That's what I was even using in my line of work as a counselor, leading people to the love of the Father. Even though there are times that I have found that God has been silent. When I am praying for a breakthrough of a number of situations, God has been silent. But I was guarding my heart not to complain or to cry or be like an unbeliever who is now wondering, did God walk away from me? Why is God absent? God, why did this happen? I, in my line of counseling, I had to counsel people who were sexually abused and molested as children. That is a difficult subject, difficult topic, difficult line of work. We mental health counselors are called to be in this line of work that we have to go into these dark places of people's life and it breaks us to the point that in America, mental health counselors have the second highest suicide rate. <laughs> the easy part as being a counselor is t talking to people and not even engaging it and telling them the solution and just walk away. But counseling is not like that. That's not the way Jesus even counseled. There was this period of time that there was a woman who was, who was caught in adultery and, and, and the, the Pharisees brought her and threw her down to the ground and said she was caught in the very act of committing adultery according to the law of Moses, she ought to be stoned. The scripture says, you know what Jesus did? He stooped down. The scripture says he stooped down. He went eye to eye level with that woman. I teach in the counseling classes Jesus' principle. He stooped down, went into an eye to eye level, and then he stood up, and then he told the Pharisees, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Then he stooped down back, and he wrote some things on the ground, and then they left one by one. Then Jesus told her, Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. That was the style of Jesus. And I too want to follow that principle, even though Jesus got killed <laughs> by the very people he counseled. But I am hoping I don't become a statistic. <laughs> but as a counselor, I got to learn to guard myself. I got to watch myself. Where do I go? I go to the scripture. I go to the word because this is the only hope that I have. It grounds me in my foundation. So I want to go to a text in the Bible and it's going to be from Luke chapter 15. We're going to actually look through this whole chapter. That's where the context is today's sermon. And it's going to talk about the Father's love. Being, being a, a Father's Day, I want to talk about the Father's love from this chapter. But before that, let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, 
Oh, Father, we, your children, are calling you as our Father because through your Son, Jesus, you have opened up the door that we can become your children and you can become our Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus, through the reading of your word, may your word minister to us, may your word speak to us, may your word open up the eyes of our understanding, that we may understand the power of your love for us. That when we have come to this fullness of the knowledge of the Father's love, we will never be in darkness, never be in doubt, and that we will always know that with your love, we are able to do great and mighty things to fulfill your destiny in our lives. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 15 is where we are going to go, and I believe the scriptures will be up here soon. Luke chapter 15. And while we are turning there, I just want to read Luke chapter 18, verse 10. No, 19, verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So Jesus is saying, the very purpose of his existence at that time, the purpose of him coming is to seek and save that which is lost. My goal here today is not just to seek and save the lost, meaning the non-Christians, but also the Christians who have walked away. The Christians were on the verge of walking away because something happened. Something that they couldn't tie up. Something that they're struggling to understand. God, if you are God, the one whom I have loved, the one whom I have followed, why did this thing happen to me? Why did my child die? Why did I have to bury my child? As I say in my book, the smallest coffin is the heaviest. There are things that we will experience as Christians which we will never get the answer on this side of heaven. We will not get an answer. Just like the book of Job, as much as he cried out to God, God never answered him. God simply showed himself up and Job began to understand that there are things, thank you God, for not letting me see or hear certain things that you have protected me from. Be grateful for that. Don't think that just because we have all the knowledge, we will be better. Be careful what you ask for. God is a wise God. He loves us unconditionally. There are things we cannot understand why certain things happen. If I should die according to his time, even as it may seem that it is outside of his time, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What better thing is there to be? Though he slays me, though he slays me, Job cried out, yet I will trust in him. So we go that. So Jesus, we know his ministry is to come to seek and save the lost. So in Luke chapter 15, it begins to say, then all the tax collectors and the sinners draw, or drew near to him. What a beautiful moment. Sinners were coming to Christ. That was the goal. Jesus was going to draw the sinners, and here they came. But the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, complained, saying, how can this be? If he is a man of God, doesn't he know that he is fellowshipping with sinners? So they had this self-righteous mode, these Pharisees, who didn't understand the purpose of Jesus' coming to this earth. One of the reasons I want to bring this message to you is also that may this church, may you, each one of you, may you be known for the love of God in your heart, soul, and in the practice of your life. May, may the people of the world see God's love in you. That is the key. That is a sign 
that you are a child of God. That is the sign. This is a non-compromising, non-compromisable quality of a Christian. There are times at the ER when I've seen this patient without speaking anything about the Bible or anything, when they look, they somehow saw certain things and they say, you must be a Christian. And that alone led some of them to say, I'm going to start going back to church. May you have that. May the love of God be that sign, be that indicator that the light is shining through you. So here, the Pharisees couldn't understand. So they said, they murmured and saying, these men receive sinners and eats with them. Like as if that was a sin. Well, in that time, it was. They were so culturally backward. So they, when they saw that a good man, a righteous man eating with sinners, they accused him of doing wrong. But then Jesus goes on, according to this chapter, to give out three parables to show us God's love. God's love that the scripture is showing. So I, wonder, I want us to go through in, 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 in a step by step. The first part, it says in verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them. So Jesus is now going to teach them something. So he starts off with a parable, which we all know, this is the parable of the lost sheep. We are familiar with this. So it says in verse 4, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends, neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. Jesus says, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So Jesus now gives the first parable of the lost sheep. But remember this. Look at the way he's presenting his teaching. He is bringing out a revelation of God. He's bringing out a teaching about the nature of God. The nature that he's bringing out through this parable is that God, Jesus, is our shepherd. He is our shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Is he your shepherd? If he is, what kind of shepherd he is? What kind? Do you know to the extent of what kind of shepherd he is? We already saw in Luke chapter 19 verse 10, for the Son of Man has come but to seek and save that which is lost. Here the scripture is saying, look at certain key words he's saying, that, that if a man has 100 sheep, if he loses one, there are those who will say, you know what? I have 100 sheep and this one gets lost, Guess what? This one always gets lost. <laughs> this one always gives me headache. No matter what you do for this little Jimmy or whatever, sorry if your name is Jimmy, but <laughs> this sheep always goes lost. But God is saying, Jesus is saying that he will leave the 99 go looking for that one. He will leave the 99 and he will go looking. There is a cultural understanding in this portion, which I did some studies, which I hope to present to you within the time I'm given, so that we will have an understanding according to the Jewish culture. I was blessed and privileged to be in Jerusalem this past January, and I was able to see some things and did some additional reading to get some background information, which I'm hoping to present to you in such a way that we'll have a deeper understanding of this God. So the shepherd, this is a good shepherd. Jesus is a good shepherd. When one of his sheep goes missing, he will leave the 99 and he goes looking for that one. Now we may tend to think, wait, I've already spent seven days, eight days, nine days, ten days looking for this one. You know what? I think it's a gone case. I think it's a gone case. I'm just going to give up and go back to my 99. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says this. He says in verse 4, he says, If he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go 
after the one which is lost, what's the next word? What's the next word? Until he does not give up, he will come for you. He will come for you. Somebody may have walked away from God, having had life one time and may have walked away, but the love of God is so powerful, unconditional, he will not give up. And he will come searching, seeking for you. No matter where you are lost, he will come looking for you. Have that in your soul, have that in your spirit. He will come looking for you until he finds it. Until. That is the kind of God we are serving. I saw that in my life. Going to America was not an easy piece of cake. I have never suffered the, much, the amount that I've suffered. It was not an easy test because I was leaving Malaysia, going to a, a, a country like America and having to go through the whole process of doing the legal way and trying to trust in God. And there were days that you had nothing and only thing you had was just dependence on God. I will never exchange that experience because it was in those darkest moments is when I I truly discovered God. Thank God for that experience. In your darkest moment, when you learn to stay anchored, you know he will come looking for you. He just wants to hear the sound of the bleating of the, of the voice of the lost sheep, and he will come to get you. Interestingly, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, is, is when David is anointed as king. Next chapter... Chapter 17, 1 Samuel, you can read it in your time. There was this time that Goliath had showed up. Goliath was representing the Philistines. And there was no one in the camp of Israel who was ready to face Goliath. Then David came and David said, what? No one is available. I will go and fight for him. I will go and fight against him for the nation of Israel. King Saul said, wait, you're a young guy. He's a man of war. How can you go? Interestingly, when you read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, this is what he says. I was a shepherd guarding my father's flock when a bear or a lion came and took a lamb, not even a sheep, a lamb. I will go fight against it and rescue that lamb. And when the bear and the lion came against me, I took it down. This is the man who wrote in Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But that tells me the heart of King David that he will go fight bears and lions just to get a lamb out of the mouth. We would look at it and say, would I want to put my life in danger to go get that lamb which is already in the mouth of the lion and the bear? Yes. As Christians, we are called to go into dangerous places just like Christ did. In order to come to save us, he was killed. Same principle, but he's talking here that the shepherd, the good shepherd, will come looking for that lost sheep. If any of you, you are here, you're experiencing that, that, that verge of walking away from God, I don't know what you're experiencing, but I am telling you, hold back. Hold back and consider this. Look at the life of Job, and Job, you will know, never had a thought of walking away from God. Take everything away. How does he know? I am challenged. You know why? God wants to be found. God wants to be discovered. But there are times to have a deeper understanding is for us to go through that season of suffering, that season of challenging, challenges. But when you experience God during those serious times, you will attain to a higher level of the knowledge of God. Sometimes he plays hide and seek with you because he wants you to come find for him. Know that for, from God. 
So Jesus had just done this first parable. Then he goes down to a next parable, as we see in verse 8. Oh, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light up a lamp, sweep the house, seek diligently until she finds it. Now this was, uh, according to the Jewish culture, there was this Jewish woman who had ten coins, possibly made into like a chain. Now that could have been a, a, a symbol of a dowry or a gift from somebody that she's engaged to, a man who she's engaged to. So he would have given her the dowry and it had those ten, uh, 10 silver coins. That 10 silver coins cannot be touched by a debtor or anybody that she owes money to. That is special. But when she lost that one coin, it was no longer legitimate. But what does the scripture say? She goes and spends the money, light up a lamp, sweeps the whole house until she finds it. In the same way what Jesus is saying, we are the bride of Christ. He has paid us with a price for a dowry. He's coming back. He's coming back. The bridegroom is coming. But we got to be diligent to make sure that our coins are in place, our value are in place, our worth are in place, so that when he comes looking for us, we will be ready. The bride will be ready when the bridegroom comes. Jesus is telling us, when something gets lost, look for it. Don't even let your faith be lost. If there was a time you had a fiery faith, and somewhere along the way you lost it or something got lost, seek and search for it until you find it. We can say how good and how strong are we as a Christian. We can say I've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years. How much have you grown? How much has the knowledge of God increased in you? The day and the time that we live in are so challenging that you need to take your walk with God into another level. Into another level. Darkness is surrounding. And I'm coming from America. And you saw and I, you heard where I'm telling you from my experience of even working right now at the hospital, seeing what's happening to that places. And similarly here too, when darkness arises, do you have the light of God on the inside of you to guide you? Darkness, let it come. But you have the light of the world on the inside of you. Do you have enough light? Do you have enough knowledge of the word of God where you can say in Psalm chapter 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Does that lamp give you light to search your house, to search within your possession, to look and secure that which is lost. If there is something that you have lost along the way, find it. The love of God will compel you to go looking for it because of the challenges of the day and the time that we live in. It is not easy. It breaks me sometimes when I see that people that I had to pass through my hands, pass through my service, who go on to die who go on to die. But at least there was some security that when I know that they are in Christ. I don't want to get into a theological argument. If somebody commits suicide as a Christian, do they go to heaven? That can be in that line of argument. My first general answer is yes. Yes, the Bible does not kind of give us a term that somebody commits suicide, they will go to hell even though they have accepted Christ. So right now I will say, whoever you have as a loved one, be careful. Be careful how you counsel. I cannot be a counselor to the people that you know. And many of the people that you know will never go to a counselor. So you are the counselor. You are the hand of God. You are the mind of God. You are the heart of God. And you will go to them with the light to save them. God will use you to rescue them. So I pray that each one of you, it's not just a Sunday thing where we come, we worship God. God is calling you, empowering you, energizing you to reach your neighbor. To reach your neighbor. I had an awesome experience yesterday. My brother who operates 
uh, uh, grocery shop along with the family, and there was this lady he knew. She was going through some difficulty, challenges, and he just brought her up to the apartment, and I was able to just counsel her, give her some words about understanding season of suffering, and right there, she was ready to accept Christ. And she accepted Christ yesterday. I only arrived on Friday morning. And she accepted Christ. And I, I, I'm sure my, my, my brother's wife and the children here will follow up with her. That's a big key. The question is not just who, who said that prayer of salvation. It is a somebody who becomes a disciple of Christ. So I'm sure they will follow up. But I was just there to be used by God at that appointed time, just like how you will be. So like the woman who lost that one coin, out of uh, one silver coin out of the tin, she searches the house until she finds it. If you are praying for somebody, don't even give up as if that's a lost coin or lost sheep. You go looking. You go looking. The shepherd himself, when he goes looking after that one lost sheep, he puts himself in danger. It is not easy. It is not easy to go looking for a lost sheep. He has to go into unknown territory looking for that sheep. And he knows he's putting his life in danger, sacrificing to look for that. But that's the heart of God. That's the heart of the Father. That's what he's doing. He will come looking for us no matter what the cost is. Then he moves on. Verse 11. Then he said, a certain man. Now he goes to the third parable. So remember this. Jesus is building something here. He started off with, with the first parable. A man who had 100 sheep, one went missing. That's 1%. Woman with 10 coin lost one is how many? Uh, 1%. Now how many percent is that? 10%. Now he goes to a third parable. A man had two sons. One went off. How many, how, what's the percentage of loss? 50%. But Jesus is trying to build a foundation here of an understanding of the Father's love because he's trying to speak to the Pharisees and the scribes because sometimes we can be the worst Pharisees on the face of the earth, even today. How dare you? How dare you do such a thing? How dare you compromise that? How dare you allow this person to come into your fellowship? How dare you do such a thing? We can be the worst modern day Pharisees as Christians. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. But here Jesus is trying to teach a lesson. So the parable here is, is a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Interesting. The cultural understanding is basically the second son, the youngest son, is saying to the father, Father, I wish you were dead. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. I wish you were dead. So that according to the will, I will get what I what comes to me. He was literally exactly saying that to the father. I wish you were dead now, so give me what belongs to me. The father then says here, and says, so he divided to them his livelihood, which means the father was forced to divide the inheritance to the older son, to this younger son, and whatever is left for the father. What an insult in a Jewish culture that is ostracizing. That is breaking fellowship. That is the lowest of the lowest or the highest of highest insult you can ever give to a father a son can do. And Jesus is saying about this. These were the sinners who walked away from God, who walked away from the Jewish culture, who walked away from the knowledge of God's word. But Jesus is saying something. Look at what he's describing as the father. Now he's coming to the third parable and he's talking about the father. And he says in verse 13, Now, and not after many days, the youngest son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. 
This was not a smart son. We all know that, right? Because the moment he got his possession, he didn't realize he lost the source of income. All that he had was what was given to him. He doesn't anymore have that source of income. He lost contact with the father. All he has what was, was given to him. So if he doesn't let it stretch, he's going to one day lose it, and there is no more source. Many Christians do that. With a little bit of challenge, I, there was this joke that I used to say, because I, I, I used to know this guy who lived a few blocks away from us. His washing machine would break up, and he would curse God. For a small little thing, something that breaks, something that gives way, God, where are you? Why are you allowing me to suffer through this? Like as if God is up there playing who's washing machine to be broken next. <laughs> that in itself tells us what is our concept of God. That's the concept of God. We got to be careful lest we don't understand God and call upon him all kinds of names and accuse him of all kinds of things when he is God. When he is God. God cannot do wrong. God cannot lie. If God can lie, he sees us to be God. That's the God that we serve. We may not understand, but he can bless us in such a way that Romans chapter 8, verse 28. That was something that was a time that I was going through my very intimate challenge at the time I was writing this book that you will find on the cover of the book at the foundation here of that lighthouse is 828. Where does 828 come from? What book does it come from? Romans 8.28, all things, good or bad, all things, all things, good or bad, will work together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his promise. And I started writing my book on the 28th day of August. That's why I put that scripture on that book. All things will work together for good. But let's read on. So he journeyed, wasted his possession, and when he had spent all there arose, all that he had, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swines. A Jewish man was sent to feed Unclean animals. That's a no-go. You don't do that. Now he's adding insults. He's adding insults to the family. Adding insults to the family's name. That he being a Jewish man, not only he insulted the father, the family, now he's feeding swines. The insult is increasing. What would the father be thinking? What would be the father that's thinking? I don't know whether there are any prodigal sons who may have left the father's house. You may be a Christian. You may be. But there was a time you may have walked out. And there is still a, a gap between the son returning to the father or the father and the son coming back together. If there is one, I, I pray that the Spirit of God will minister to you today. May there be restoration of peace today. May there be restoration of love today. So as we read on, when he had spent all, he went to feed the swine. And then look at the conversation that begins. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the part that the swine ate. How low he went. And no one gave him anything. And then the scripture says, but when he came to himself, I like that. That moment of revelation, that moment of true moment, the aha moment, he came to himself and he says this, and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? 
suddenly he came to a realization. And then he planned on this, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned. Listen to this and read through this. Father, I have sinned against heaven. That means against God. And before you. What a revelation. What a repentance that he began to acknowledge this. Many of us, part of it, in order to enter into a place of reconciliation with certain things, this is where we need to come. I have sinned against heaven and against you or whoever it is. And I come to this place. This man had an understanding of his father. Now, there are those who will say, I cannot go back to my father. My father will insult me like a dog if I ever say those statements. But then this father had shown a heart to this younger son that he can have that thought of having that thought of saying that I will go back to the father. That I will go back to the father. So he's going back and he's planning this. And he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And then he arose, came to his father. When he was still a great way of his father, the father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Due to time, I just want to make sure I, I kind of wrap it up in such a way that it will increase your understanding on something. There is this portion of the scripture which you can read on your own in Luke chapter 15. There was an older son. After the father accepts the younger son, there was an older son who said, this son of yours who came. He, he is even refusing to call his brother. This son of yours came and that you killed the fatal calf but you never treated me good. There was this indicator that Jesus is using this older brother in reference to the Pharisees and the scribes. He's telling the Pharisees and the scribes, you are like the older brother who refused to rejoice when sinners are coming into the kingdom. Indirectly, he was telling them, you don't have the heart of the father in you. You are judging and condemning like the older brother. You are in the house and yet you live like a beggar. And yet you say, the father has not blessed me. Not because the father has not blessed you. You have not learned to get what belongs to you. Now that's the second part. Now this is the part I want to close up but also tell you this. Remember it says here, verse 20. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, and when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck. I want to give you a cultural understanding that's going to open up this scripture, which we need to do a deeper understanding. I'm going to give you some words that you can Google. If I give you that word now, if you Google, you'll become a pillar of salt. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so I'm going to keep that word till the end because you will be tempted to look at it. But there is a cultural understanding in that perspective which we must understand. Okay? So let's, let's go with this. The youngest son has insulted the father. They were possibly living in a village, okay? A big village, and, and they all had their communal community that guards and protects each other for their values. When this younger son insulted the father in the way that he did, and he left, which means they have cut him off. The village had cut him off. Just like what you and I will do when you don't like somebody on Facebook, what do you do? What do you do? You unfriend them. Right? That's my village. That's my Facebook friends. You will unfriend them. You push them out. Same thing this village did that. 
Where I'm getting is, I'm going to give you the name of the person. It's called Kenneth Bailey. He lived for so many years. He's passed away, and he studied the Jewish culture, and that's where I got some of his background understanding of what this is. So there is a term that this was applied. So, so what I'm saying is this. So the son was cut off from the village, was cut off because he insulted not just the father, not just his family, but the village itself. The scripture says that when the father saw him from afar, what does that tell me? What does that tell you? Sorry? He was looking out for his son. What a heart of compassion and a love. The father could have said, he insulted me like a dog. I will cut him off because he's no longer worthy for me. He has lost everything. But the scripture says, the father saw him from afar. That means he kept looking. That's the heart of the father. He kept looking. And then what does the scripture say? What does it say? When the father saw him and had compassion, and what? He ran. The father was a nobleman. If he had that much of possession and a house full of, of, of servants, he had a huge possession. He had so many servants, all he has to do is just say one thing or point a finger, they run. They will do what he's needed. He's the boss. He's the big man. A nobleman of such stature does not run. He had his robe on. He literally had to lift up his robe and expose his feet. A nobleman does not insult himself by showing off his feet. But he insulted himself by running towards the son. There is this teaching also that the father ran to just outside the village. There was a gate. Visualize this. The elders of the community, the elders of the village, when heard that this young boy was coming back, they started lining up at the gate to prevent him coming back because they have cut him off. They carried water pots. They carried water pots and each one of them were holding it because they were about to perform a ceremony. They were about to perform a ceremony which I'm going to give you the name but please do not Google it yet. It's called Kazaza, K-E-Z-A, oh, sorry, Z, sorry. American is Z, so K-E-Z-A-Z-A-H. Google that, and you will see where I'm coming from of this cultural understanding. That was a ceremony. That means the moment somebody tried to enter the village, if they break the water pots, Kazaza ceremony will be initiated. The son can never come back into the village. But the scripture says the father insulted himself, ran outside. As he was running, here were the people telling him, stop, stop, stop. He has insulted us. He is no longer welcome in this village. We have unfriended him. We are about to perform this kazaza ceremony. He is not allowed to. But the father insulted himself, took upon himself insult, went outside the gate, took hold of the son, grabbed hold of, of him, met him where he was, and hand in hand, he brought him back. And he was telling the elders, not today. 
This is my son. I'm bringing him home. Not today. Drop your pots. This is my son. Jesus lifted his robe. He insulted her. Or he was allowed to be insulted that he stood naked on the cross where he was disrobed so that you and I can come back to the Father's house. That was the purpose of this passage. That was the power of God's love. When the Father ran out, hugged the Son, and they came hand in hand, he told the elders around, not today. I don't care what ceremony you have. I will be insulted for whatever reason, but this is my son and I'm bringing him home. He did that for you and I. He allowed himself, the son of God, allowed himself to be insulted, to be ridiculed, to be killed, to be murdered, to be done, all kinds of things where he ex had to be exposed in the most shameful way. Why? So that you and I can be found back in the house of God. That is the purpose of this passage, to show the power of God's love. Stand with me to your feet, please. And call the worship team up. I know we sang that song, The Father's Love. Yeah. I don't know where you are, where your walk with God is as a Christian, but without anything of that, first, you must know how much God loves you. Before we can even say, I love God, I can only first must know how much he loves me. The greatest commandment that God has given to us is, thou shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, strength. But first, I begin to experience his love what he has done. When you experience that in your life, that will set you free on so many levels. It will bring to you a peace that says, I am secure in God's love. Even if you are here today, I'm going to open the altar up. If you feel like you have done something wrong, even against God, or against somebody else, or against your father or against somebody that you know, and it is, there is a difficulty of being reconciled, but I want to invite you up front today to first get right with heaven. Get right with heaven. Get right with God. Let God's love that knows no bounds engulf you and take you to that place and feel the freedom of the Father's love who has insulted himself, allowed himself to be ridiculed so that he can bring you home. And now that we have been brought home, may we never be like that older son. May we be, always be the son that honors the Father. As we worship God, I want to say the altar is open. Come and we will just pray together. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Thank <laughs> you.